So to give you a bit of an update on the succession process, um, we actually announced back in March that we are going through a transition here in the leadership team. Um, pastor Larry Davis is going to be stepping in as the new lead pastor of Northgate, and I'm going to be stepping into a, a new role as a teaching pastor, so I'll continue to be here, uh, continue to be doing a great deal of the preaching and teaching um, every weekend uh, throughout the rest of this year. But we did start this uh, plan actually way back in October. We made it first announced to, uh, to all of you on, uh, in the middle of March. And so just wanted to give you a bit of an update before I get into today's message. Um, the transition month is next month, uh, the month of June, and we're going to be making that transition. And so there's a couple of dates and important things that I want to uh, point out to you. The first is um, what you just saw the announcement um, is an opportunity, kind of a meet and greet, a chance to really get to know Pastor Larry. Uh, many of you know him and um, see him, um, and he preaches up here on stage, but getting to know him a little bit more personally is something that uh, we think is very, very important. So I want to encourage you, beginning this Sunday afternoon, there's going to be open houses. Um, the open, first one is this afternoon from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. You're welcome to stop in at any time. Um, I encourage you to get there at 3 o'clock because we'll be able to do some introductory words. Um, but it's just a chance to ask questions, get to know him, to hear a little bit more of his story, um, how he came to Northgate and ministry experience that he's had. So we really encourage you, um, beginning this Sunday afternoon, also Wednesday, this, uh, Wednesday evening this week, next Sunday as well. And then um, there's a couple other dates. They're in your bulletin. They were on the screen. Really make use of these opportunities. Uh, and we want to um, have it, people engage as much as possible in this process and get to know him the way that we have. Um, the other uh, important date is uh, June 3rd. June 3rd is our annual membership meeting. Um, we have two of them a year, and June is the annual meeting. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing at the annual meetings is uh, giving you a little bit more of an update on this process and where we're at. Uh, a part of that evening will also be a Q&A time with Pastor Larry and myself. Uh, if you have any questions, if you're a member, I encourage you to be there for that. Um, that'll be after the uh, 1130 service. So we're going to start about 1:30, um, and that'll be on June 3rd. So uh, make use of that opportunity. Then June 17th will actually be my last sermon as senior pastor. I'm still going to be here. But um, I want to be able to share on, on that date a little bit of life lessons that I've learned over the last 28 years of leading this church as senior pastor. It's Father's Day, and so they're going to be good life lessons for dads. Uh, they're going to be good for everybody. But just some things that I have learned over the years that have really um, helped me as uh, not just as a dad or a husband, but as a pastor. And so that'll be June 17th. And then on June 24th, you don't want to miss. Uh, June 24th is going to be installation service for Pastor Larry. Well, we will officially pass that baton or Bible or whatever it is that we're going to pass. Uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> pray together for him and his leadership and wisdom as he continues to lead Northgate. And then he is going to be sharing his vision of what our mission, helping unchurched people become wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ, is going to look like as we move into this next season in the life of our church. So you really want to make sure that you are here for that weekend. It's going to be a big, big weekend, an exciting weekend, and um, he's going to be able to start sharing a little bit more um, and tease it out over the next couple of months as what that's going to look like. So I am so excited about this uh, place in the time of, and life of our church family. God has been so faithful over the last 28 years, and I know he's got great things ahead, and I'm excited to still be a part of that. I'm excited for Pastor Larry and his leadership, and uh, I hope you join me in all of that. Now, here's one thing that I do believe, and it actually goes to what we're going to be talking about today, is, and, it, and it's been since day one, since we first started Northgate way back in my living room 28 years ago, there is something that I've always believed, and I believe uh, up till this day and will continue to believe, and I believe it's true for any church, but I think particularly for us as a church and something that we have been founded on from day one. And it's simply this, that, that the success and the health and the vitality of a church does not depend on any one individual. It just doesn't. God did not design his church that way. God designed his church in such a way that the health and the growth and the vitality of a church, any local church, depends on the people using their gifts for God's purposes. And, and spiritual gifts are absolutely essential. 
there's no way that we would be the church that we are today were it not for those of you who are serving and using your gifts that God has given to you. So today I want to be talking about spiritual gifts. And we're using this Believe book as a resource for this whole series. If you have not yet picked up your copy, um, they are free. We're making them available to everybody. Um, if you want an additional copy, you can do that for five bucks. Um, but we're encouraging everybody to pick up a copy of this. Be a part of a community group because in the community groups, we're discussing each thing. This has been um, a thing we started actually at the beginning of the year. And the first section was all about this idea of what is God's work in this world, his redeeming work in this world. Now we're in the middle section where we're talking about what does it look like? Okay, if that's what we believe, what does it look like as we act on or live out those beliefs? And it has to do today with spiritual gifts. And this is what Paul wrote about um, in a number of places. One of them is in his letter to the Ephesian church. In your Bible, it's the book of Ephesians. Um, but it's simply a letter that Paul wrote to this church in a city called Ephesus. These are the words that he wrote in chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. He says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, prepared in, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Chapter 4, beginning verse 11. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Wrote about the same thing to the Roman church, Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. He writes, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Those are only two of the passages that we have in our Bible in which Paul talks about this idea of spiritual gifts. So today, I kind of want to unpack those a little bit and talk to you about spiritual gifts. Some of you have maybe heard this stuff before. Some of you know all this stuff, but you are not acting on it at all. So today, what I want to tell you is, is some of the essentials, the things that you need to know about spiritual gifts. And the first one is this, that God has uniquely gifted you for his purpose. Every one of us in this room. And, and, and God has a purpose for your life. And you are uniquely gifted and equipped for that very thing. God has been in this redeeming work all through human history. That's what this first section of believe was all about. These are the things that we believe, that we have lost that relationship with God because of our own sin and rebellion. But God has been in the process throughout human history of redeeming that mankind, you and I, back to this relationship with him. And now you and I, at this time, in this place, have a part in that redeeming work. That every one of us, are called to be a part of the work that God's doing in this world. He has shaped you, he has fashioned you, and he has called you. This is what Paul wrote. He said, we are God's handiwork, his work of art, his hand-shaping, hand-fashioning work of art created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And the good works we are called to do are those that God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul's saying every one of us 
who become a follower of Jesus Christ, that God is working in your life and has been working in your life and continues to work in the, your life to this day for the purpose of doing good works. And it's not just any good works. It's his good work. That every one of us in this room, if we are a follower of Jesus, are, are called by God and prepared by God to do these works. You have something unique to offer this world that nobody else has to offer. When you were born, when you were born, you were born with a certain set of talents and abilities that nobody else has. That you are unique with that. And along with that, when you were born, you also got a personality. And your mom or your dad can tell you at a very early age, that personality started to show through right away. And, and it was all part of God's creative work in you. And that was the beginning of his work. Now, over the process of your life, he has brought you through certain experiences and circumstances, which has been a part of shaping your character and molding you into the person that he desires you to be. And also throughout your life, you have acquired certain skills and abilities that maybe weren't natural talents, but there's just things that you have learned how to do over the years. And now what Paul says is once you become a follower of Jesus Christ, once you put your faith and your trust in him, that the spirit of God himself now indwells you. And when the spirit of God comes in and indwells you, he also comes and gives you these spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts are meant to be used for his purposes. This is what he said in verse 7. He has given each one of us, that means everyone in this room, no exceptions, a special gift through the generosity of Christ. There is no one who is exactly like you. You have something unique to offer this world. You have a, a unique work to do that's a part of what God is doing in this world. Your personality your talents, your abilities, that everything about you is a little bit different than anybody else. For some of you, it's a lot different than anybody else. But we are all different. We, 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 we interpret things differently. We experience things differently. We even hear things differently. You might have um, heard this this last week. It is the, all the rage online now. Um, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but, but here it is. We're going to play a little audio clip, and I want you to just don't say it out loud. What do you hear when you hear this clip? Okay, listen to this. Laurel. 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 All right. How many heard Yanny? How many heard Laurel? Now that time I heard Yanny. The first time I heard this, I heard Yanny. Then we played it earlier this morning on the sound system and I heard Laurel. Now I'm hearing Yanny again. I don't know what's going on inside my head. But it has to do with the frequencies that you're able to hear. If you tend to hear more strongly on the lower frequencies, you probably heard Laurel. But if you tend to be tuned more in the higher frequency range, you probably heard Yanny's. It was the exact same word being spoken. Listen again. See which one you hear. Laurel. 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 All right. Did anybody change from Yanny to Laurel? You did somebody change. Okay. Um, we, we, hear, we, we are unique. And that's just one way in which we hear things differently. You are unique. And that unique mix of talents and abilities and skills and experiences are all, and spiritual gifts are all part of God's unique fashioning of you. And it's all part of what he wants you to do with your life. Ephesians 4.11. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, he only names about four or five of the gifts right here. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are only five of a list of gifts that are number more than 20 if you go all throughout the New Testament. And the primary passages are this one here in chapter 4 of Ephesians also Romans 12, which we read earlier, and then 1 Corinthians 12, the first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 12. And all of those, they're listed at more than 20 different gifts. He's saying, here's five of them, but they're not exclusive. In fact, their gifts are meant to equip people to discover their own gifts and do their own works of service. My biggest job, according to this passage, is to help you discover your spiritual gifts 
and how they mix together with your talents and your abilities and your experiences and your skills to do the thing that God has called and prepared you to do with the rest of your life. And I said earlier, some of you know this stuff, but you're not doing anything with it. And God created you to be a part of the work that he's doing in this world. Now, spiritual gifts are not the same thing as natural talents. Spiritual gifts are not the same thing as acquired skills. They are specifically designed for use in God's work in this world. So let me give you a definition. Here's what a spiritual gift is. It is a God-given ability. In other words, it's a gift. God-given gift empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit at work within you for accomplishing God's work in this world. That's what makes spiritual gifts unique from anything else. They are uniquely given to you to be a part of what God is doing in this world. And because of that, it's imperative that you discover where your spiritual gifts are. Now, there's a couple ways you can do that. Like I said, one of our jobs is to help people discover their gifts. In fact, Romans 12, 3 says this way. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In other words, do an inventory. Figure it out. Think it through. And there's ways that you can do that. We do it. One of the ways that we do it around here is through a class we offer um, fairly regularly called Find Your Fit. It's part of our Northgate U program. In fact, Find Your Fit in two weeks is going to be offered. It's a one Saturday morning seminar from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock. And you can sign up for it today out in the, in the lobby there in the Northgate U table. And I encourage you, if you have no idea where to even start in finding out where your gifts might be, that class, you'll learn about all the different gifts and get an idea as to what might be yours. Some of you are already in the rooted process. And rooted is one of the a discipleship process that we're using around here. And in fact, this week, if you're in rooted this week, you're talking about finding your gifts, finding your abilities and what God prepared for you to do with the rest of your life. And, and, and if you, if the, another way, but here, by the way, if you've picked up your book, but have not picked up your book, okay, you know what I mean? All right, pick up your book, pages 283 through 285 are the passages all put together on where spiritual gifts are and what they're all about. So pick up your book and read that. Um, here's something else you can do. There's a number of different online uh, resources. One is called giftstest.com. And, and you can go online, and it's a survey, a little questionnaire that you've filled out, and, and it will help you find where might be your gifts. But here's the best way. Here's the best way to discover where you might be gifted. Start serving somewhere. Just start serving somewhere. Where do you start? Start in an area that you think you might have some interest in or, or some giftings in. If you love babies, nursery might be a great way for you to serve the church. If you love young children and our children's ministry, that's another opportunity. If you really like hanging out with middle schoolers and high schoolers and being a part of youth ministry, talk to Pastor Jerry. If you just have a bubbly personality and you love meeting people and you, you just you know, have that warm smile, you could be a part of our greeter team. If you've got music talents, talents or, or, or technical abilities, you could be part of our worship team or our tech teams. There's all kinds of different areas that you can get involved. So just start somewhere. Now, what we say around here is just test drive a ministry, okay? Once you sign up for something, you are not locked in for life. We give you the opportunity. If this is an area that you think you might be interested in, sign up for that. Serve in there. Shadow, observe, watch, then get an opportunity to actually serve in there. And if you decide, you know what, this is not me at all, it's okay. We'll let you out. We'll put you in something else, but we'll let you out of that, okay? Because the idea is that we are all uniquely gifted by God for his purposes. And the second part of that is this, that using your gifts is not optional. It is not an option. It is the express design and will of God that his church operate by the people doing the work of the ministry. It is not an option. Gift-based ministry is the expressed will and design of God for his church. Verse 16, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. 
so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Everywhere in scripture where it talks about this idea of spiritual gifts, it uses this analogy, Paul uses this analogy of a body that has many parts to it. He does it here, he does it also in Romans 12. It says, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And in the same way that in your human body, if all the parts are not functioning correctly, the rest of the body knows it, and the rest of the body feels it, and the rest of the body suffers because of it. So it is in the body of Christ. It's allergy season, and I have terrible allergies, and my eyes are itchy and red and runny, and my nose is runny, and I'm coughing and all that stuff, and my whole body knows it's allergy season. You know when something is wrong and you just don't feel right. Every part of you just doesn't feel right. A lot of you know I'm actually deaf, completely deaf in my right ear. No hearing there at all. I have to make adjustments because of that. When we go out to dinner, we go out somewhere, uh, and we, you know, we get seated at a table, my wife always has to ask me, which side do I need to sit on? Because if she sits on the wrong side, we're not having a conversation over dinner. <laughs> well, she might be having a conversation, but I'm eat, just eating, you know. We have to, I have to make allowances for that. We have to make adjustments for that. If I come, when I come home from work, she usually gets home before me. So she'll come in. I'll walk through the door, you know, say, hey, I'm home. And she'll say, I'm in here. And then I always have to say, where's here? Because I don't know if you know this, just like your eyesight, you need both eyes to have depth perception. You need both ears to have a sense of direction where sound is coming from. And if I come in the house and I say I'm home and she says I'm in here, I have no idea where in here is because I have no idea where that voice came from. If you see me out on the, comp on the campus around here somewhere and say, hey, Pastor Ken, and you see me doing like this, <laughs> it's because I have no idea where that sound is coming from. The whole body suffers because of it, and I have to make allowances because of that one thing. The same thing is true in the body of Christ. If there are parts that are not functioning, everybody suffers because of it. If you are not using your gifts, everybody else in this room feels it in one way or another. So if you haven't discovered and you aren't using your gifts, we all are missing out on it. You are missing out on it, but so is everybody else. Bruce Bugby put it this way. You are needed in the church, not just because there are slots to fill, but because in and through your ministry gifts, God's grace is released and his purposes are fulfilled. And when you find your gifts and you use your gifts, everybody benefits from it. And that's what Paul talks about. So he actually wrote to a young protege of his. He was mentoring a young pastor named Timothy. Actually wrote him two letters, at least two letters. Two of them are at least in our Bible. And he wrote them. Um, and the first letter, he wrote these words to Timothy. He says, do not neglect your gift which was given you. In other words, you have a gift, Timothy. God has gifted you and called you to pastor the church. Don't neglect that gift. Give it attention. Work at it. Develop it. Keep on it. And I guess somewhere along the line, Timothy maybe kind of forgot that, so he wrote him a second letter. And in the second letter, he said, I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Stir it up. Stoke the fire. Don't be lazy in all of this. This is not optional. And I'm not just talking about pastors and missionaries and evangelists. I'm talking to every one of you. Stir up the gift that's inside of you because it's not optional. And then the last one is this. Whatever your gifts, use them wholeheartedly. Use them wholeheartedly. Not begrudgingly, not reluctantly, but wholeheartedly. Because it's not just about discovering and developing and using your gift. It's really about how you use your gift. It's not just the what, it's also the how. Paul wrote about it this way. He says, if your gift is prophesying then prophesy in accordance with your faith. In other words, use your gift to the fullest extent that you can. 
If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, he says, give generously, wholeheartedly. If it's to lead, do it diligently. Pay attention to it. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. That God designed his church so that it's taught by teachers, led by leaders, um, pastored by pastors. Um, all of these things, he designed it that way. And he says, give it your whole heart. Work at it with all your heart. Don't think of it as an obligation. Recognize that it's an opportunity. A while back, uh, my wife and I went out to dinner, one of those times where we had to figure out who was going to sit where. Uh, we went to dinner actually in Walnut Creek. And, and Walnut Creek has something that Benicia, and I don't even think Vallejo has, um, meters, parking meters, okay? And, and, and parking in Walnut Creek is not easy, particularly around this particular restaurant we were at. So drove around the block a couple of times. I just thought, well, okay, we're going to lose our reservation. So I dropped off Betty, um, and I just kept driving around the block. And then I found a spot. Not only did I found a spot, it was a spot that somebody was just pulling out of, and there was still money left on the meter. Yes, score, you know? And I got to park on somebody else's dime. Actually, I think it was a dollar. I got to park on somebody else's dollar, which is great when you're looking for parking. But I think there are far too many Christ followers in far too many churches that are parking on somebody else's dollar. Know what I mean? The body of Christ only functions fully as each part does its work. And we're to do it wholeheartedly, not waiting for somebody else, not standing back and, and let somebody else take care of it, but to jump in and do it with all of our heart. Colossians 3, whatever you do, he says, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And in case you didn't get it, a couple sentences later, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. In other words, don't be careless. Don't be lackadaisical. Don't put it off and let somebody else do it. Jump in and do it and do it with all your heart. And by the way, if you are here today and you serve in just one of the ministries of here of Northgate, let me just say publicly from up here, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, because, because we would not be the church that we are today were you not serving. And by the way, when you walk out of this room and you walk by one of the greeters or one of the ushers, would you tell them thank you for what they do? When you stop by the help desk, the information desk, the new friends, would you just thank those people for what they do? If you go and get a cup of coffee in the cafe, would you just thank the people back there making coffee for you? If you've got kids and you pick them up at the nursery or their classes or, or your students at the high school ministry, uh, middle school ministry, when you do, would you just stop and say thank you to the workers that volunteer there? Because they don't do it for the thank you, but it sure means a lot when they hear it from you. See, that's how the body of Christ was meant to function. When you give yourself wholeheartedly something, here's what you discover. Your heart grows bigger. When you serve with passion, you get greater passion from it. When you serve lackadaisically and it doesn't matter all that much to you, then you're going to get out of it exactly what you put into it. But when you serve with all of your heart, your heart grows larger. Your life becomes richer and more meaningful. And your work for God has greater impact number of years ago now, uh, before we actually had moved up on this campus and we were using, we didn't have a baptistry, so we were using people's hot tubs and swimming pools, wherever we could get some water together. Um, that's where we would do our baptisms. And we had one particular baptism years and years ago now. Um, and I think we had like 25 people get baptized this one particular evening. And it was a beautiful summer evening towards the end of summer, August warm, beautiful. The pool was nice and warm, which I was grateful for. Um, and it was a wonderful evening, and people were just kind of hanging out and brought refreshments, and so we were just kind of hanging out for a while. And I was sitting next to one of the 
um, one of the people that was, was actually with us from the very beginning in our living room, one of the founding members of Northgate. And we were sitting there and we were just talking about what an incredible, incredible evening this was to see people whose lives were changed and now taking that public declaration of their faith in Christ. And we were sitting there, and I, I've, shared, I've shared this before because it has stuck with me to this day. He turned to me and he said, you know, he said, this was wonderful. And he said, God would have found a way to reach these people. But if we had not done this, if we had said no, we would have been the ones to miss out. God is going to do his work. God will find a way. But if you are not involved in what he is doing, you're going to be the one to miss out. Don't miss out. I've said this before too. I cannot think of anything else that I would rather give my life, my one and only life to, than to the work that God has called me to. And I pray that for each and every one of you. Would you bow your heads with me? So God continues to do his redeeming work in this world. He does it without fail. But he has invited you, not just invited you, he has called you. And with that calling, he has equipped you and gifted you to be a part of that work. He's given you all that you need to fulfill it. So here's the deal. What's your next step? What are you going to do with that? Maybe you've been serving in a ministry, and, and maybe you've just kind of taken a break. And that's okay. We understand that. Everybody gets tired, and, and you need a little time of refreshing. But maybe it's time to get back in the game. Maybe for you, maybe it's just test driving a ministry. You said, you know, I've really not done anything. I've been parking on somebody else's dollar, and, and you know what? I, I need to get involved. And maybe that's your next step. Maybe your next step here, maybe your next step is, I don't even know where to start, and finding your fit would be a great place to go. But I'm going to ask you today, would you just say yes to God? God, whatever it is that you have for me, whatever it is that you want me to do, whatever it is you're calling me to or gifted me to, I'm available. Would you just make that your prayer? Now, that's the beginning of a process but if you would just today be willing to say, God, I'm available. Yes, I'm available. And then take the next step to find out where that spot is for you. I would like to pray with you and acknowledge that today. So I'm going to ask you to do something like we do each week. If that's your response, to so just simply say, yes, God, I'm available. Here I am. Would you raise your hand? Hold it up. Look up. Catch my eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. Imagine what God can do. Imagine what God can do with this many people just saying yes. Just saying yes. Now, maybe you're here today and you feel like, you know what? I know my past and I know what goes on on the inside of me and I don't know that I'm qualified. In fact, I think I'm disqualified. I'm not worthy. I'm not acceptable for God's work. You couldn't be more wrong. That's part of his redeeming work. That's what he does. And we believe around here that there is nothing so lost in anyone's life that it, God cannot find it. There is nothing so broken in anyone's life that it cannot be mended. And there is nothing so dead in anyone's life that God cannot resurrect it. And maybe for you today, it's a first step of faith. It's that first gift of God's grace that you just come to him and say, Lord, here I am with my faults, my failures, my sin. I, I can't undo any of this but today I'm willing to come clean and I'm willing to say take me as I am and would what you did on the cross apply to my life and forgive me because I want to follow you for the rest of my life and maybe that's your prayer today and if it is same thing would you just raise your hand hold it up look up and catch my eye I want to acknowledge you yeah Let me invite you to just make this your prayer. Yeah. 
And whether it's a first time decision or just a new step of faith, the prayer is always the same. Lord, here I am as I am. You know me. You know my faults, my weaknesses, my failures. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. Please, Lord, forgive me. But I'm also giving you my life. And I'm saying I want to follow you and I want to serve you. And I want that meaning and purpose that comes only through you. And so today I'm saying, yes, Lord, I'm available. Whatever that next step is for me, I'm taking it today. Putting my faith and my trust in you, I will follow you and serve you with my life. In Jesus' name, amen.